I am a moon worshiper. I say goodbye to an old moon at dawn in the east, waning crescent right on the horizon greeting sun. Then I revel in the dark nights. And after a few days, I carefully spy the setting crescent in the west, appearing right after the sun goes down. Every night I see a fuller moon until the big, <coughs> full, round moon rising in the east at dusk to the setting full moon at dawn. And then I watch the moon rising in the east every night a little bit later than the last. I am a moon worshiper reveling in her light, mirror shine of the sun always changing shape, reminding us to be like the tides, being pulled in and then being pushed out. This is moon's gravity, pulling at us all. Waves and tides and currents show moon's pull best of all, reminding us that we too wane and wax and flow and grow and shine and not. I am a moon worshiper. I flirt and wave and gaze and bless this mighty moon of ours, cold white curve every night appearing, sometimes smiling, sometimes pregnant, sometimes losing weight, sometimes saying goodbye, my moonshine night. I am a moon worshiper. I travel a great distance to be at the great earth circle, below the great lake of the Erie and the great waterfall of Niagara and above the Ohio and Mississippi river system that flows to the ocean. Between this is a place of the greatest earthworks in the world. Here in Ohio, all dedicated to the moon cycles. I travel to honor the moon rise in the center of the opening of the great circle, the 19 year cycle of inner moon, the moon breathing in, I am present, I am moon gazing, I am waiting and feeling and stealing a look at the moon, rising at the very entranceway of the great circle. I am a moon worshiper. Every night I try to say hello to her. Hello, I say, I'm here, still here, and you're there, still there. Shine on, bathe my dreams in moonlight. Shine your light on my worries and not. Untangle my knots, light up the night. I am a moon reveler, entranced by the sight of the moon every night. Hands and feet and minds, melding of worlds, melting of time, light filtered through canopy, falling on still leaves, shadows falling on memories. Woven moments come upon, listening for gravel, for breeze, the hum of deep summer. Words upon words stuffed in with straw, worn gloves left behind, carefully to retell the weaving of twine, of wood, of rock, into hope imagined, hope realized. Thank you. I can't go back. I go on. Memories turn then move along let me cross childhood terrain trespass eminent domain echoed places left behind from distant time run down paths of hard packed dirt and weeds to a haven where red brick ruins stood Secret hideouts going undercover None would find us, no one would And I can't go back I go on Memories turn, then move along let me cross childhood terrain, trespass, eminent domain, echoed places left behind from distant time. Struggling against grey-winded nor'easters to 
Presidius, where my bold youth bore witness to pounding waves crashing in, crashing in. Power far beyond my small self can't go back. child arrives to say goodbye to this childhood place where no memories die bound by roots in window frames fossils of shadows left unnamed and I can't go back I go on Memories turn, then move along. Let me cross childhood terrains, trespass eminent domains to echo places left behind from distant time. And I can't go back, no, can't go back. can't go back. Thank you. When I was just a boy, without a sigh, without a yawn, I woke from dreamless sleep one winter morning before dawn. My house was still and quiet. So putting my big coat on, I escaped into a snow-filled night, unnoticed. Down to the wood I walked, where trees were bare yet seemed serene, where the moon full bright poured down her silver light, a pearly screen. And there it was revealed to me a clearing with a tree, lavishly adorned with green leaves and red berries. From every corner of the sky down to that rowan tree, the birds thronged to taste the bitter fruit it offered graciously. Those outstretched boughs, the scarlet berries speckling the snow, left a cinder burning in my heart, a truth no one shall ever know. Though I am old, I still recall the night that rowan tree left an image here imprinted on my heart indelibly. And when I scan the long span of my life from then till now, I find nothing closer to the truth and nothing less than all God will allow. Thank you. We went out for dinner like we always do. Friday night is Italian, light beer and pizza too. It started uneventful, but it went downhill from there. I gave her a compliment, she said, it's not my real hair. So we left the restaurant and I headed for the bar. And I let her drive cause I was high It was too far Outside her apartment I began to fall And the last thing I remember Is nothing I recall Until I woke up in the morning Outside her front door Wearing nothing at all 
Was it my cold feet? Did I steal the sheets or sleep in my overalls? Did I make a sound like a hound chasing a hog? Does a heartache become a heartbreak once you take a fall? Is that how you wake up naked in the hall? There was alcohol involved and a locked apartment door. The sudden disappearance of all the clothes I wore. The elevator opened, much to my surprise. A little old lady shouted out, who's the naked guy? And all the neighbors answered by opening their doors to see me sprawl down the hall, lying on the floor. So I grabbed a piece of paper that had been crumbled into a ball, covered up my manhood and stood up against the wall. And all the neighbors noticed what I should have instead. On the paper, in red lipstick, was a note she wrote that said, You got cold feet, you steal the sheets, you sleep in your overalls. You make a sound like a hound chasing a hog. And a heartache becomes a heartbreak once you take a fall. That is why you're waking up naked in the hall. Well, the neighbors finished reading, went back behind their doors, except a little old lady who gotten off the wrong floor. <laughs> the elevator opened, much to my surprise. And there stood the woman I love with a tear in her eye. She was holding cups of coffee, French pastry, and cheese walked up to me softly and said excuse me please opened her apartment and quickly locked the door locked it so i would know not to go there anymore all because of my cold sheep stealing feet so guys make up with her before you wake up without her and find you have no one to call no phone no pocket her front door she locked it and lying on the other side of the wall are the keys to your pickup and you're naked as a hiccup, crying, curled up in a ball. You're going nowhere at all when you wake up naked in the hall. Wake up naked in the hall. Thank you. What would happen then? A bird, bright and quick, blue with livid streaks, would arrive on the windowsill as official harbinger, and then the low would be raised up, the sneers crushed under their own bricks, the teeter-totter would cease to choose sides, and all in peaceful sway 
I'm sorry, and sit in its peaceful way on its fulcrum. The kiss that had been held back all those years at last would release into the mouth in flood, and why not would replace all other dicta, but gently as a, as a sunlit nudge. Thank you. Once there was a man who was born blind, and as he grew, he lived with his sister, and he would sit outside of her hut in the day, taking in the sun and the sounds that he heard. 
it was soon discovered that he was a very wise man and people would come to him with questions and concerns and he would listen carefully and always the advice that he gave was the right advice. And people wondered at this man who couldn't see, who lived in darkness, who understood everyone and everything. Finally, his sister became engaged to a hunter from another village, a very brave and brash hunter. So he came and lived with her in her hut, but so did her brother. And he had no time for this man who couldn't see. I mean, a hunter has to be able to see very clearly and sharply. He couldn't understand the point of someone who couldn't see who lived in darkness. Well, many times the blind man would say to his brother-in-law, will you take me hunting sometime in the jungle? And it was all the hunter could do to keep from laughing at the thought of taking a blind man on a hunting expedition. Well, eventually after days, weeks, and months, the hunter had come home having killed a gazelle and he, his wife had cooked the food and uh, they had a great feast and he was feeling very jolly from whatever sort of alcoholic beverage they have in his village in West Africa. <laughs> and he said, tomorrow, brother-in-law, you can come with me on a hunting trip. So early the next morning, the two men left and they went into the jungle and they were walking. And as they were walking through a dense part of the jungle, suddenly the blind man said, stop, wait, listen. And the hunter stopped, surprised and listened and couldn't hear anything. And he said, what is it? And the blind man said, there's a lion just ahead on the right. And then the man said, I see nothing. He said, there is a lion, but it is all right. He's eating. He's got his kill. He's eaten, and now he's sleeping. We can go safely by. Well, they walked a bit further, and they did see the lion sleeping. Well, one of them saw it, and one of them already knew. And they walked further, and they came near a place where there was a water hole. And then the blind man said, stop wait, there is a water buffalo. He may be coming out of the water soon and he's, he will know we're here and he could attack. So the hunter being chastened by the blind man having known about a lion that he couldn't see himself, waited and soon they heard the crashing sound of the water buffalo who crossed their path ahead of them and did not see them and did not smell them. So they were safe. Eventually they came to a place where the hunter said, we will set two traps, yours and mine, to catch a bird each. And they stayed waiting a long time. And they slept in the forest, in the jungle. And in the morning, very early, the hunter and the blind man came and the hunter said there are two birds, one in each of these traps. And what the hunter could see was that in his own trap, there was a very plain gray bird. And in the blind man's trap, there was a beautiful silver, red and emerald green bird. But he took the plain gray bird out of his own trap and gave it to the blind man to take home. And he himself took the blind man's bird, the beautiful colored bird. As they were walking home, the hunter suddenly wanted to ask a question because he knew that many people thought that the blind man knew many things. He said, tell me, brother, why is it that there is so much hatred and war in the world? And the blind man softly said, because there are so many people who want to take what is not theirs by any means. Well. This struck the heart of the hunter very strongly and he realized that what he'd done was wrong. He said, brother, I've taken your bird. Here, let me give you the bird that your trap caught, which is a beautiful bird of many colors. And let me take the bird that my trap caught, which was a plain gray bird. And as they continued to walk through the jungle back to the hut where the blind man's sister lived, where the hunter's wife lived, he said, tell me, brother, how is it that there is so much goodness in the world? 
And the blind man softly said, Well, it is because people are like you, and they learn by their mistakes. Many of them do. When they got back to the hut, they continued to live, the three of them, together. And the blind man would still sit on his bench outside the hut during the day and the sitting in the sun and listening to the world go by. And people would come. Some would say to the hunter, who was from his own village, how can you befriend this man who lives in darkness? He cannot see at all. Ah, said the hunter, he may not see with his eyes, but he sees with his ears and with his heart. Thank you. Gaggle of grackles, ravenous sparrows, descend upon my lawn to picnic on the seeds laid out that very morn. Just takes one bird to spread the word as far as two woods over. Now, bumping into one another, chirping, burping, no one looking, slinking into the yard. Black patched white cat from the hood, good times to be had. In stalking mode along the fence, low to ground, sans any sound, eyes transfixed on the feathers. He settles into crouch position, a bounding leap from the bevy, and he stares. Thirty seconds without blinking. What's he thinking? Is he choosing? Instead, he whispers, meow. <laughs> Birds in panic scatter to trees. Black Patch turns, saunters away, transcendentally pleased. <laughs> Thank you.